Good evening, and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Katie from Greenlight, and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Oliver Rader, launching his new book, Seven Games, A Human History. So we'll be talking with David Hill, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Oliver, David, and the team at WW Norton for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. Although we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Before we get started, there's just a few housekeeping things to go over. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here, though, and there are a couple of different ways that you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and to interact with fellow attendees. So if you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that in the Q&A module, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program, so please make sure you're putting them there and not in the chat. And importantly, tonight's featured book, Seven Games, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. at both our Fulton Street and Flatbush Ave stores, where you can purchase Oliver's book and many others on site. You can also order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup uh, at the store or for shipping anywhere in the US. And I'll be dropping the buy link in the chat in just a moment. As a thanks for attending tonight's virtual event, we're offering 10% off the featured book. Just enter coupon code GREENLIGHTEVENTS10 into the coupon discount section at checkout online for 10% off. And that will be um, in the link too. So you can copy and paste that uh, coupon code for later. And Oliver will be stopping by our stores to sign copies of the book. So you can get a signed copy or even a personalized book by request while supplies last. Just make sure to indicate your signed copy request in the order comments field at checkout when ordering online by midnight tonight, or look for signed copies when you visit the store. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Our interviewer for tonight is David Hill, a writer from Hot Springs, Arkansas. His work has appeared regularly in Grantland and The Ringer and has been featured in The New Yorker, The New York Times, GQ, and New York Magazine, as well as on This American Life. He lives in Nyack, New York with his wife and three children, where he serves as the Vice President of the National Writers Union. He will be speaking with our featured author, Oliver Rader, who has been a senior writer at 538 and editor of The Riddler, a collection of the site's math puzzles. He studied artificial intelligence as a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University and holds a PhD in economics focused on game theory. He lives in Brooklyn, New York. Raider's new book, Seven Games, is a group biography of seven enduring and beloved games, as well as a, his a story of obsession, psychology, history, and how play makes us human. Oliver is going to be starting us off with a reading from the book, and then he'll be talking with David and with all of you. Please take it away, Oliver and David. Thank you very much, and thank you everyone for being here and uh, weathering this year's long uh, Zoom fatigue. Uh, I'd like to read a little bit from my chapter on uh, backgammon, which I think captures a lot of the themes of the book, games and chance and, and humans and computers sort of all in one. So I'm going to read you a few pages from, from backgammon. On a recent winter afternoon in a large hotel on the west bank of the Hudson River, the 13th New York Metropolitan Open Backgammon Tournament, one of the largest on the circuit's calendar, was contested. When I arrived, about 100 people were sitting in close quarters at tables in the hotel's ballroom with nearly the entire island of Manhattan visible outside panoramic windows. But the Statue of Liberty, the World Trade Center, and the Empire State Building were afterthoughts to these people. Probabilities instead filled their heads. They sat in front of large, custom-made tournament boards with merino wool surfaces and inlaid wool points. In their dizzying and garish circus array of colors sheathed in leather and topped with pearlescent checkers, the boards reminded me of the ivory and silver game found in that tomb in Kustul. These modern custom boards, little coliseums of chance sell for upwards of $1,000. And to accommodate travel and tournament logistics, the boards fold up into handled objects that look exactly like briefcases, giving a tournament the appearance of a strange business meeting. But the most noticeable thing about a backgammon tournament is the noise. 
It's as if a distant yet mighty cavalry were approaching over the horizon, countless hooves clapping on the ground. Hundreds of dice being jostled and cast, rattling and skittering, determining with each microscopic tilt and bounce the fates of their players. The dice, specially made so-called precision dice, half an inch or so in width, are placed in small padded cups with trip lips on their rims for maximum randomness and fairness. Then they are shaken vigorously and at least twice up and down per federation rules and rolled from a height of at least one inch. Alternatively, they can be dropped into the top of a small acrylic tower abutting the playing area called a baffle box from which they fall bouncing through a series of little plastic rods and eventually shooting out the bottom onto the surface of the board. Similar contraptions were found in that tomb along the Nile. The second most noticeable thing about a backgammon tournament is the number of cameras. Above nearly every board in the room was a small GoPro camera, most of them suspended in midair by a pair of adjustable metal rods. At the boards without video cameras, the players would frequently take cell phone photos of the positions in front of them. Later, the players will plug these visual records into their computers for assessment and analysis. Before GoPro, top players would hire annotators to sit by their sides and record every move of their games by hand. In the hotel bar down the hall from the tournament, no fewer than six pairs of players were hunched over laptops and iPads, debating positions and consulting their silicon oracle, XG. In the game's heyday, the bar at a backgammon tournament would have been full of money games. Present at this tournament and fresh off a win in his first match of the day was Masayuki Mochizuki, known in the backgammon community simply as Mochi. He's widely considered to be the best player in the world and has been voted number one on every Giants of Backgammon list since 2013. A slight man with piercing eyes and a wide smile, he was easily recognized because he was wearing the same crisp white shirt as in his Giants of Backgammon photo. He grew up in the game's computer age, but also migrated to it from other pursuits. As a young man in Japan, Mochizuki was an enthusiastic and competent player of shogi, also known as Japanese chess. But he peaked at that game, and as a university student, student in Tokyo, he was poor. Backgammon, he thought, could solve both of these problems. Games of no chance, such as chess and shogi, typ typically offer little gambling action and therefore little potential for fast profit. The better player simply wins too often, creating scant opportunity for a betting market to be made. Games of chance, however, such as backgammon and poker, attract gamblers. The worst player can win, and by definition sometimes does win, and might then misinterpret his good fortune as skill and come back for more. Chance, in other words, is a fertile garden in which human ego and delusion flourish. When the sucker wins, he thinks it's because he's better. When the sucker loses, he thinks it's because his opponent got lucky. Now, that's an interesting topic, Mochizuki said, perking up as we sat just outside that playing hall in Jersey City, the muffled rattle of dice still audible. I had asked him about the impact of the machines on the game that has become his livelihood. In the view of the best player in the world, that impact was large, undeniable, and twofold. And I'll leave it on that cliffhanger because I think we'll uh, address both of those two two folds as, as we discuss. But um, thank you all for listening. Well, thanks for that reading, Ali. I thought that was really a good selection that you chose there. And um, I just want to start off by um, by uh, applauding your book and uh, thanking you for writing it. Honestly, I feel like this. This is like the book that I always wish someone would write, although I'm not sure I exactly knew that I wanted someone to write that until you, your mind sort of put this all together for people like me. Um, and I would hope that we could start our conversation off by you telling me a little bit about, telling us all a little bit about how this book came to be, how you kind of got the idea, you know, how, I mean, 
I know that you're someone who plays a lot of games, um, so I'm sure that this has cooked in your imagination for a while, but could you tell me a little bit about how you kind of came to arrive at this idea as a book? Yeah, of course, and thank you for the, the lovely introduction, David. Um, I was professionally, my professional history, I was always going to be an academic. That was the plan. That was the plan from day one. No, no plans to be a journalist or a writer, no plans to write a book. And I was doing um, a postdoc at NYU and I had this classic academics problem, which is, you know, the work I'm doing is clearly incredibly important, but no one is reading it. Like, isn't that, isn't that a shame? And I was always a big fan of 538, had a friend from college who worked there and I pitched them a version of this very, very important work that I was doing in my postdoc. And the editor said, uh, no, thank you. We aren't interested in that right now. Uh, but the editor, uh, bless him, uh, noticed online that I played competitive Scrabble, which I did at the time. I was a, a tournament Scrabble player. So instead of, of doing the, a version of this very serious work, I wrote uh, a profile of, of the world's best Scrabble player. And that was the first act of journalism uh, that I ever committed and uh, became a, a staff writer at 538. And one of my uh, beats there was, was games. Um, Scrabble, of course, the World Chess Championship, some, some video games. Um, crossword puzzles, just kind of all these, these brainy game game or game-like pursuits. Um, I paid, paid close attention to them and admired them because I admire obsessives. And I saw all these people devoting so much of their lives to, to these pursuits. And that signaled to me, these must be worthwhile things to think about and to write about. And on top of that, um, as, I, as I covered games and puzzles and the like, you couldn't help but notice the computer sort of creeping in at the edges. So AI, just as it is in some senses in the real world, AI creeping into the world of games. Um, so I wanted to, to grapple with, with kind of two things at once. One, the devoted and obsessive subcultures that devote themselves to games and puzzles. And two, the rise of technology and how and how it affects these these very historically very very human uh, pursuits. That's really fa that's that's fascinating. I mean, so I take from that that not all of the seven games that are in seven games were games that you were you know maybe that intimately familiar with before you set out to I don't know investigate them for for this for this project. Yeah, that's right. So, some of them I was very, very deeply enmeshed in and, and had been for many years. And some of them I, I had barely touched um, before. And one of the examples of the former uh, was Scrabble, which I had played, as I mentioned, very seriously uh, for many years. But one of the examples of the, of the latter was a game like Backgammon, which of course I was aware of and, and I had heard of and I sort of roughly knew the rules. But one of the things I tried to do when writing the book was, was to take these games very seriously. And for me, that meant, that meant playing them, right? Like just as if I was writing a book about, uh, I don't know, Van Gogh, I would pin some Van Gogh prints to my wall so I could look at them all the time. If I was writing about backgammon, I wanted to, I wanted to play backgammon all the time to get, to get a sense of, to get a sense of it, of the flavor of it and, and, and how it felt to play. Um, so yeah, a big a big part of the reporting for the book was was learning how to play some of these games. Backgammon was one, Go was another, uh, and Bridge. These were kind of the three that that I had the least experience with. Um, but uh, but yeah, you find I think you find sub you find a lot of similarities in each. You find devoted subcultures. You find this rich um, these rich stores of human literature. Um, these devoted expert players, many of whom are very sort of generous with their time and, and want to sort of evangelize their, their chosen game. So even, even though I hadn't necessarily been certainly not an expert in, in most of them, I, I found myself at, at home among the gamers. And Dave, I'm sure you can you can empathize with, with this experience. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's one of the things I mean, this book is about seven games, but even more than telling the story of the games, you tell the story of these obsessives, these people behind, you know, these people that you meet who sort of, um, 
have devoted their lives to them. And a good example is in the chapter on checkers where, where the book kind of opens with this section on checkers. And that's a game that I've never been that curious about that I don't feel like I had spent much time thinking about. And I was a little bit like, am I really gonna enjoy this section on checkers? But, but when I met Marion Tinsley, I realized, you know, it was just such a, an incredible story and such a fascinating person. And um, it just, I was completely captivated by it. And I think that I should have had more faith because obviously I think there's any, with any game, if you find a person who's obsessed with that game, that person is gonna be basically an artist. And so they're gonna have the, a life that I think is gonna lend itself to some real narrative drama. Yeah, that's right. Uh, a, f a few thoughts on that. I, I completely agree that like if if one wants interesting stories or to to write about interesting things, one one ought to follow the obsessives because they're really on to something. Right. And yeah, I I think and I thought much the same as you before before I began this project that the checkers um, I think checkers gets a bad rap, right? I think checkers is thought of as a child's game, uh, sort of uh, pre-chess, this thing sort of relegated to uh, indoor recess during, when it's raining in elementary school or whatever. But in fact, checkers is this incredibly, incredibly deep game, something like 500 billion billion possible positions can be played on a checkers board. And indeed checkers was the theater for one of the most engrossing battles in, um, in gaming history. I think it's fair to say, I don't think I'm exaggerating, where you had, as you mentioned, Marion Tinsley, the best checkers player the world has ever known. And I think there's a decent argument that he was the best competitor at any competitive pursuit that the world has ever known. And on the other side, you had, you had a computer uh, and a computer at the time, roughly 20 years ago, when computers were sort of seeing this inflection point and increases in, in speed and increases in understanding um, AI algorithms and, and search, search algorithms. And you had this sort of mortal battle, literally mortal battle uh, between uh, programmers and computers on the one hand and human players on the other that sort of uh, overwhelms and takes over this first, first chapter of the book that I hope sort of encapsulates a, a lot of the themes that, that follow. Well, let's talk a little bit about that theme, especially the one that you sort of alluded to in your reading about the sort of two, the twofold um, concern that Moki had with uh, technology encroaching into the game. I mean, you know, I mentioned before that I kind of see these games obsessives as artists, and I think of games as a, as a form of art. Um, and I, I, I worry about how much sort of technology kind of taking over some of these games is um, changing that that way that we think about games, maybe for the worse, or maybe not. Maybe there's a new way that technology is teaching us to appreciate games that will will enhance it. I don't know, but I'm curious to hear your take on on this this particular question and sort of the looming either threat or promise of technology as it impacts games. Yeah, fantastic question. And yeah, let's step back like half a step, and I want to I want to talk about this art, this art games as an art idea, and and probably unsurprisingly, I completely agree with you that games are art. And in my view, I don't I don't mean this in a grandiose sense, but in in a pretty concrete and literal sense, where games are their own art form. So, for example, uh, painting captures the visual world and music captures the, the heard world and games capture something else, which is agency, human agency, this idea of deliberating and deciding and, and acting. And games sort of put us in various modes of agency, which may or may not be available to us in the real world. So for example, I'm not often in the real world given the opportunity to command an army into battle, for example. But in games, this is like very available to me. So this, this, is, this is what games capture as art. Um, and to what extent is technology um, imperiling this art? Well, I think, I think my answer is, is multifaceted and, and a bit subtle. I think the, the first thing that I would say is that despite the advances in AI and in technology, games are still available to us. 
to me, to you, to probably most of the listeners, to the sort of rank and file, the amateurs, the strivers, the hobbyists. I think the computers have taken none of games uh, away from us. And we're still very, very much able to, to appreciate the art that they provide. I think at the highest levels, the sort of pinnacle of skill of these games, the effect of the machine has been uh, complicated and double-edged and profound and sort of varied by game to game. So I think, I think we'll get into that um, as we keep talking, but um, to, take, to, take the check, to stick with the checkers example, um, checkers was solved by the computer. What do I mean by solved? Well, we, know, we now know, thanks to this computer work we were talking about before, that a perfectly played game of checkers is a guaranteed draw. Just like we know that a perfectly played game of tic-tac-toe is a guaranteed draw. And, you know, there's not a lot of high level tic-tac-toe being played. There may be somewhat more high level checkers being played, but I think in some sense, this diminished checkers at, at the highest level. And I think we've seen similar, but maybe less acute effects in the games of chess, which I'm sure we'll talk about, the games of poker um, and, and probably others where this sort of maybe the, the sort of tip of the human sword in these games has been a bit blunted by by the machine. Yeah, I think I think that's both chess and poker in, are inter are the examples that I immediately think of too because you know there was quite a bit that was made and you you talk about this in your book in the 90s with computers and chess and whether or not humans would be able to continue to beat computers at chess or whether computers beat humans and once Gary Kasparov loses to Deep Blue people sort of you know, it was like, th that was like this apocalyptic moment where this is the end, you know, for human chess, but it wasn't. And today, the best chess players in the world continue to play chess with each other. And they know that their iPhones can beat them, but they don't let that, you know, they say, well, we'll just play each other. Um, and in poker, I think that um, we're now seeing the beginnings of a real revolution there with um, the way that computers um, are approaching, you know, being able to play not perfect, but you know, fairly close to perfect in, in how they play poker. And what one of the things that I've seen, and maybe this is lower state, maybe this is more superficial and maybe not that important to the question that you just raised about how it's blunting that tip of that human spear. But when it comes to these games obsessives and the Marion Tinsley's of the world, I do think that when you see the best players at some of these games today who have become really good at games because of their work with technology and computers, you don't see the same types of colorful personalities that you might have seen in the 1970s or the 1980s with these same games and the people who were sort of brilliantly, you know, sort of almost savant level of these games. I wonder what you make of that. Or am I, is that something that maybe we shouldn't concern ourselves with? Is that maybe just that people are different in general today? But I do notice that we don't see the same kind of colorful characters around these games today that we did maybe not even that long ago. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think, Taking the poker example, um, so in, reporting the book, I played in an event at the World Series of Poker and uh, promptly lost uh, a chunk of the advance I was paid uh, to write this book that we're discussing, uh, but you know, well worth it for, for the reporting. And you know, after, after I was knocked out of the tournament, I went to um, the sort of rented house of some, some real poker professionals who were playing in, in the sort of month long World Series that summer. And, and one of the concerns that they expressed to me was very similar to yours, which is that in order to keep a healthy poker ecosystem of players and of fans and of entry fees and so on, we need to, to attract these people via engaging personalities, right? We need these sort of quirky people that ESPN puts on TV to sort of to bring in uh, new players. And, and what we don't need are these like young guys who have spent the 22 years that they've been alive staring at the computer and learning its lessons. And I think there's something, there's something to that. Uh, this sort of modern state of poker has a lot to do with machines and specifically programs called solvers, which are sort of what they sound like. Um, you kind of type in 
a poker situation, what cards you have, how many chips you have, how many players you're facing. And, and the machine approximately perfectly tells you what to do. And there's a lot of that sort of memorization going on. And if you walk the halls at the World Series of Poker, there's a lot of uh, hushed conversation about, well, what did the solver say? And, and, and this kind of thing, it's, it's very pervasive. So I, I, I understand that concern, but I can tell you as someone who's played in the World Series of Poker, there are absolutely no shortage of colorful characters who play in the World Series of Poker. At my table alone, to my editor's chagrin, there's like two pages in the book describing the people who sat at the table I sat at the World Series of Poker. Uh, including like a woman who was carrying a gun and so on. So I, I think the colorfulness of poker is not really in, in any immediate uh, danger. But again, I think at the very, very highest levels, the influence and maybe the dulling influence of the computer is really um, undeniable. I think this, so the computer and poker has driven this something called GTO, Game Theory Optimal, which is sort of driven by these decades old game theoretic mathematical ideas sort of put into practice by the computer, which sort of allow a poker player to sort of be by himself or by herself and sort of sort of play according to mathematical maxims rather than the social game that that poker is is often in historically thought of. So I I think there's something to that at the very, very highest levels, but poker remains like an unbelievably humanistic game in, in my experience. <laughs> I want to, um, I like that answer a lot. And I, th and I, and I think that, uh, I, I think there's some real truth to what you're saying. I, you know, I, I want to ask you about, um, about the future of games because, you know, I have kids, my 11 year old son, he plays competitive chess and, you know, he's pretty good and he's been playing it since he was five, but he's also very interested in video games. And, um, one of the things I constantly find myself telling him is, is chess has been around for thousands of years. These games aren't going to be here 10 years from now. You know, like this is, these games are just, they're just disposable games. But he seems to feel very passionate about whatever the newest sort of latest video game is. I wonder what you think about the games that you've chosen for your book. And this moment we live in now where there's currently more, more games available to us than ever before in human history. And they're beautiful and they're interesting and they have a lot of depth. I mean, not all of them, some of them are very shallow, but you know, there's so many games available. And I wonder, and every day there's new ones that are invented. Do you think that there will ever be another game that can be added to <laughs> the sort of pantheon of, that you've created here of seven games? Will there be another game invented that will last another, you know, thousands of years? I mean, and just today we heard about Wordle, you know, getting bought by the New York Times for whatever it was, a million yeah. dollars. Congratulations, Mr. Wordle. Right, the, a game that last year we sort of discovered and now everybody is playing it. Do you think that there will be a, is there still a possibility for another game to be like that? Or is there something fundamental about the games that you've chosen here that really makes them, you know, the building blocks that will last forever? Yeah, I think to, to take a sort of half step back to talk about the, the seven games that I, that I did choose for the book. Um, my choosing them was not to suggest that these are the only games worth, worth taking seriously. And, or that there couldn't have been six games or eight games or nine games or whatever. But I chose them for a variety of reasons. One is that they have histories, they have active subcultures, active competitive scenes, likely familiar to many readers, and each had seen uh, serious computer science AI research to try to, to, try to conquer them from, from that side of things. Um, and the games in the book are sort of, are ordered in a sort of specific way, in a sort of um, hierarchy, rough, rough though it may be, where each game sort of adds a feature. So as you move from, for example, from Go to Backgammon, you're adding randomness, or as you move from Backgammon to Poker, you're adding hidden information and deception and so on. So that's the idea behind, behind the selection of the seven games. And I do think, I do think they're part of, some some pantheon sort of undeniably um in terms of whether new games will enter that pantheon i think inevitably yes and i think like a useful thing to think about for me is is like back to the the idea that games are art like for example think of like the louvre or the met or whatever 
like will new will new art ever enter their permanent collections like of course it will is more art being created now than ever in human history like probably but such a tiny tiny slice of that like enters the canon the pantheon whatever so I think sitting here today, it's impossible to pr predict what sort of modern games, or certainly video games eventually will, will enter the canon, but will some of them like, absolutely. But, you know, it's hard to complete, to compete for space with, you know, uh, Monet and like winged victory in the Louvre or like whatever it is like, um, but I think the analogy is, is, is fairly solid with this sort of evolutionary process like survival of the fittest kind of game and and i don't think you know that's to take anything at all away from your son i think like one should play play the new games and be on the the cutting edge of of contemporary art but which ones will last i think it is very difficult to predict well and the other thing is that um people continue to rediscover these games too, even the games that you write about in your book. I mean, you know, we're currently seeing sort of this, um, this new chess boom, you know, that's, that's really fueled by Twitch and, um, and a whole new generation that has really taken to chess in a way that we didn't even see in America during the sort of Fisher years. And poker had its moment, you know, when it first was became televised where poker really blew up and everybody in America was playing poker and kind of discovered that. And now, you know, we're seeing that uh, poker players are now learning backgammon because they're getting bored with poker. And so backgammon is now the new kind of faddish game among the poker faithful. And, you know, so I wonder what you make of that. Like these games continue to kind of like fade away to where it's just sort of an older generation playing them and then they get rediscovered and and people pick them up again. Do you what do you make of that? Is that like a sort of natural life cycle? Do you think that will go on and on forever? Or, or are any of these games in danger? I mean, like Bridge is the one that I worry about the most, right? Or maybe Checkers. Are any of these games in danger of sort of disappearing from the culture completely? Yeah, I I think maybe the the analogy here in terms of art is maybe something close closer to music rather than than visual art and, and the sort of rediscovery generation by generation of like what two or three generations ago's music um i think i think the 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 on present and ongoing boom in chess is really fascinating um because i my sense of it is that it's somewhat nostalgic and somewhat of a desire to step away from from video games into something sort of more i don't know what the word is tried and true classic like forgive the word but at the same time, taking this classic thing and streaming it on on Twitch, right? This is sort of weird, this weird nostalgia expressed in, in like an utterly modern way. Um, I think backgammon is is like you say. I think it's poised. I think it's poised for for a big upswing. What's the reason for this? I I don't I don't know beyond why like. Um, kids would discover music from from 20 years ago. I think like the simple but probably unsatisfying explanation is like they're they're good games, right? They're well they're well designed, they're replayable, and you know they've been around for in backgammon's case, I think millennia. In in chess's case, 1500 years. Um, so I don't have a great explanation other than like these things have been around for millennia. So why not a few decades longer? Um, but yeah, Bridge Bridge has, uh, at least in its modern um, incarnation, a much more recent history, I think less than less than a century. And I think Bridge is, Bridge is tough. A lot of the games in the book have this sort of uh, exemplify this sort of minute to learn, lifetime to master kind of idea that makes games really great. Like Backgammon is in this category, Go is in this category. But bridge has a, an extremely high um, startup cost. A lot of rules, a lot of things you have to learn. You need four people, not two. Um, you need a teammate that you sort of get along with and can communicate with. And, and a lot of the sort of great players that I interviewed for the book themselves also expre expressed worry about, about bridge. But I don't know. I, as I, I saw the appeal of bridge reporting the book and, and I think many others will too. So I, I don't lose any sleep at night thinking about 
about these seven games. Well, I want to, um, before I ask this next question, I want to encourage people if they have any questions that they would like to ask you to put them in the Q&A box so that we can get to them later. Um, selfishly, I'd like to ask you about gambling. You know, I'm somebody who, I know a lot of games players arrive at gambling because they get really good at a game and then try to make money at it. I'm somebody who kind of came to games because I came to it through gambling, right? Like that I grew up in a family of gamblers and around gambling a lot. And then what attracted me to it was the sort of games behind it all and the, the thinking through gambling questions as a puzzle or you know, the sort of thinking about them as each individual sort of gambling proposition as its own game. And I wonder, so I'm obviously, you know, I, I think it's cool that and interesting that all the games in your book have this sort of connection to the world of gambling. Even Scrabble, I know, was a once upon a time was a very popular game in Washington Square Park that people played for fairly decent sums of money. So what do you make of that? Why do you think that um, each of these games has such a strong association with gambling? Yeah, great question. I think, I mean, I think one, one thing is, you know, to, to become really, really good at the games that I talk about in the book is itself more or less a full-time job, regardless of whether or not anybody's paying you to do this. So as someone who, you know, spent far too much time falling behind on his dissertation in grad school studying Scrabble words, like I wish someone had had paid me to, to become good at Scrabble. And I think in games of chance in particular, like we were talking about earlier, like there's, there's this opportunity to make a market to sort of test your skills against someone else. And I think like, it's only natural if you're, if you're spending all this time studying a game, getting good at a game to want to be sort of uh, remunerated for it. And, and some of the games in the book, I'm thinking of poker in particular, sort of just work better with money, right? Work better if, if the risk of the game has some teeth to it. If, you know, if you lose, you lose something, right? And, and an easy something is, is money. Um, so I think, you know, you see poker, obviously the, the huge flourishing example of, of gambling games in the book, but yeah, I mean, backgammon used to be this hugely popular theater of gambling. Um, a lot of money changes hands on bridge, uh, maybe in a slightly different way. Yeah, Scrabble in, in its heyday in the sort of, uh, sort of CD games clubs of New York um, was a big money game. Uh, right alongside backgammon and and yeah I don't know other than than there being chance the element of chance there being the element of skill sort of mixed together in this sort of potent cocktail and games players just wanting to sort of get by as games players and it probably comes as no surprise when I say like I think games players should be able to remit stay games players that there should be there should be an economy that supports this and and a lot of that time is probably better players supporting themselves <laughs> via via weaker players right right because there's for so many of these games there's not corporate sponsorship there's not sort of leagues or whatever there's not you know television deals so unlike with sports or even other types of sort of quasi-athletic pursuits you know that would be considered games but kind of have that people don't have another way that they can make their living at it especially the people who this that's is all they want to do is just is just play this game uh, morning noon and night which you know i think one of the things that's interesting to me about these games is just like you and what's going on with you and pat gammon right now is that they have an addictive nature to uh, quality to them right that that you can you can you stand on the edge here and sort of play a game you know in a, in a very recreational or superficial way but if you te you know once you go on the edge it's a very it's a really deep drop uh to where people get really obsessed and really addicted quickly. And I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, both with how you've fallen off that cliff before and what you may think it is about games or certain games that, um, that create that, um, that steep, uh, that steep drop for the people that quickly get, find themselves obsessed and addicted. Yeah. So I can talk about this m most sort of lucidly when it comes to Scrabble, just cause I, I fell, I fell hard off that cliff. 
and I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but I think like generally speaking, I think the beauty and, and danger, if that's the right word of games, this idea that, that they're slippery things that you can quickly fall down has to do with this sort of veneer of simplicity, right? Like, uh, like I know the rules of chess or go or backgammon. But then like you read one, one book about it or a couple articles about it and you learn something about the interaction of these rules. And you say like, wow, I never thought about that before. I wonder how that works. And you read another book or another article and you say, well, okay, now I get that, but like there's this other thing. And this idea of very simple rules interacting in this very, very rich, complicated way that just kind of keeps unspooling the deeper you get into the game. So becoming good at a game sort of opens this game up to you and you sort of figure out like, oh, like now I'm starting to understand uh, what this game is really is really about. And to, to, to sort of use a sort of highfalutin metaphor, it's like the laws of like physics or whatever, like the laws of physics are very simple but like, look at the world, right? It's like incredibly complicated. And I think games are that sort of in miniature. And in Scrabble is an interesting case, I think, because the rules of the game are essentially the Scrabble dictionary, right? The Scrabble dictionary is a long list of words that tells you if a word is valid or not valid. These are the rules. So there's like 100,000, 150,000 rules to Scrabble, valid words. And you start learning them and learning them. And like, you can't, like, what are you going to do? Stop when you learn a quarter of them? Stop when you learn half of them? Like, there's no stopping. Like, you can't stop until, until you learn all of them. So for me, Scrabble study became a very sort of meditative thing. It was sort of how I passed the time in a sort of calming and, and what I saw as, at the time as a sort of productive way. But, you know, indeed, as I was saying, like the more words you learn, the more Scrabble almost literally opens itself up to you. The more you can play, the more you can expand across the board and, and do cool things. And and yeah, I think, I think that's the beauty of games, uh, sort of simplified, crystallized models of narrow aspects of the real world that like you can sort of hold in your hands, but, but get lost in at the same time. And you're currently going through that again with backgammon. This is your new um, obsession. Yeah, that's right. Unfortunately. Um, yeah. I hadn't, as I mentioned, I think when we started, I hadn't played much backgammon for me, it was like the weird game on the flip side of the checkerboard when I was a kid. Uh, which I think is like a pretty common common feeling, and and yeah, there's like three rules to backgammon. Like you roll the dice and you move your checkers, and if there's just one checker, you can hit it, and if not, you can't, and that's about it. But like you quickly learn, you know, about uh, all these concepts that have been built up by humans over the last you know, in some senses millennia, but most seriously in, in the last hundred years. And you just find yourself like diving as deep as you want into it. So I, I've i read books by, you know, the great pre-computer humans who were learning about the game by literally rolling the dice over and over and over again in the same position, what they call rollouts to get a sense of how positions evolved. And then the great players like Mochi, who I mentioned in my reading, who grew up in the computer age where the computer can do this rollout for you. And, and just, I think sort of marveling at how much of my fellow humans time has been devoted to this ostensibly extremely simple pursuit will never not be deeply fascinating to me because I wanna know what did they see in this thing? Right. I want to understand like, OK, this thing looks simple to me, but these people del delved into it. And I, I want to understand what, what they saw. In it. And I think it's really a, a, a sort of communion that like I will I will never get enough of. You know, when I first moved to New York City in like in the late, late 90s, I um, went looking to play poker and the poker games I found were often in backgammon clubs. And it was the you know, the same places where people played backgammon, people were playing poker and people were playing chess. 
And I found that there was this really this, the, the world of kind of underground gambling in New York City was really a community of games players. And that people who, obviously the best backgammon players in the world or the best chess players in the world, that's what they're good at. But people that are good at games tend to be able to transfer those skills from one game to the, I mean, you know, like Magnus, Magnus Carlson, you know, he won that big um, fantasy football uh, contest with like millions yeah. of people in it. He also plays poker, you know, the, uh, the, like I mentioned before, the top poker players are now getting into backgammon. So it's interesting to me that even though to be like the best at something, you really have to be kind of singularly devoted to it. There is something about being a games player and having a sort of a mind for games that is, that is translatable and transferable between lots of different types of games. Yeah, no doubt. And the, Gus Hansen, the great poker player, is, is a top backgammon player, or at least is uh, from time to time when he becomes interested in backgammon. Yeah, I, I don't know if I have a wonderful answer. I could answer that as like a mediocre player who plays mini games uh, serially. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I, I, I think you're totally right that a lot of, a lot of great, good or even great games players are, are generalists. And yeah, I think, I think it's a certain kind of attraction of confront, encountering and confronting a rich but miniature world and wanting to sort of get everything you can out of it because you know, you know that it's, it's possible or, or tantalizingly maybe possible. Like Scrabble, Backgammon, uh, Gin, which I know you're interested in, Dave, and poker. Like these don't seem like overwhelmingly complicated pursuits. Of course, they're incredibly complicated, but they, they, they're games. They seem like you could conquer them. And I think there's a certain cast of mind that sort of wants to flip from one to the other and see like, okay, what is this, what is this thing about? And, and, you know, of course there's a lot of overlap in, in the skill, like ideas of tactics, calculation of probability, pattern recognition, like games, games overlap with each other in that. But yeah, I can't, I can't comment to, to um, colorfully on the top, top players, but, but I sympathize as an average player of, of, of many games. Well, it, there's a part in the book where you talk about von Neumann, right, and the in the Rand Corporation, and how you know there was a um, uh, there was a today. I think the only place that I sort of know where where being good at games can qualify you for like a pretty decent job is like on Wall Street, where a lot of finance banks will, you know, have prospective employees or whatever play poker to see how good they're at poker. But it does seem like to your point in the book about games being sort of practice and being a place where we. Um, where we uh, de uh, develop certain skills and practice certain skills that are applicable in the real world. It seems like we should be thinking more about how some games can uh, be utilized uh, more practically, you know, in, in the sort of the, the real field of play, right? And I, I, I think about that sometimes about how game theory as a discipline or whatever really was something that evolved because of the Cold War or whatever, and that we... I don't hear too much anymore these days about us thinking about games as something that can teach us something about ourselves that can actually help the world outside of just, you know, making some rich people a lot of money. Uh, I wonder what you think about that. Yeah. So I'll start by relaying a, a quick story that I heard while I was reporting this book that tries to answer the question of, of, of why do we play games at all? So imagine you're a prehistoric human, Dave, and you have to hunt dangerous and hunt and kill dangerous animals uh, for food. And you could approach this a few different ways. One, you could hunt all the time, uh, but this is a really bad idea because it's incredibly dangerous. Uh, two, you could never hunt until you got really hungry, but this is also a really bad idea because you wouldn't become any good at hunting. Or three, you could take the middle ground and you could invent a game. You could say, let's throw rocks at that tree over there, pretending like we're throwing it at the saber toothed tiger or whatever. And we can practice our aim in a sort of safe way and, and we'll get better. It's practice for the real world. And nowadays in like somewhat less violent times, I genuinely think games are still practice for the real world. So to share a personal example, 
uh, I'll go back quickly to Scrabble. So the central dynamic in Scrabble is uh, a trade-off between today and tomorrow, between this turn and next turn, scoring points this turn and leaving yourself good tiles for next turn. And this is sort of a mathematical dynamic programming problem that's been studied to death, but I genuinely think that it taught me in my real life lessons about sort of saving for tomorrow, being kind to my future self. So I think the border between games and the game board and, and real life is a porous border. And I think I'm, I've certainly learned lessons from games and, and I'm probably not um, alone in that. And I think, you know, computers, uh, play games for exactly the same reason, that games are practice. Games are like little slices of the real world that computer programmers want to test their machines on, right? If you ask a computer programmer, why do you study chess or why do you study poker? They'll say it's a test bed, right? It's a test bed insofar as it's a slice of the real world. So I think, I think, I mean, probably needless to say, I think games playing acumen is undervalued in the, in the marketplace currently as a games player and a, a game theory um, a PhD. But I, I think that um, I think I, I genuinely think they're valuable things. And I think that's being proven more and more uh, in the AI context and is probably proven by, you know, any games players that are listening have, have stories and experience of, of taking their games to sort of their real life with, with the benefits that, that come with it. I think that's a great um, sort of note for us to move to Q&A on, I think, you know, this idea that um, games could be our salvation, um, you know, that can really help make the world a better place if only we figure out how to, um, <laughs> how to, give games players more of an opportunity to show us how. But um, I have a question from Allison, and she asked how you picked the seven games to write about in the book. And I know you've mentioned some already, but maybe you can just sort of take us take us on a little tour through each of them. And Yeah, sure. I, I think by this point, I can probably rattle off all seven in a row. Um, Checkers, Chess, Go, Backgammon, Poker, Scrabble, and Bridge are the games in the book. And yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not not arguing for the um, sufficiency or necessity of this particular set of games, just chosen because, you know, actively played by humans and uh, strategically rich, mathematically rich, and also given attention by the computer players. And that was, that was sort of the rough criteria for, for inclusion. And again, as you sort of go through the book, you sort of add these features with the idea that, Roughly speaking, you're sort of hewing more and more closely to the quote unquote real world, the game that is, you know, our life once you add complexity, randomness, hidden information, and so on. So there are, I'm 100% I'm sure there are games that could have just as well been included. Uh, a big debate um, that me and my editor had uh, as sort of the outset of this project was, well, do we talk about video games? And indeed we could have, video games are, are interesting for, for very similar reasons, strategically rich, active subcultures, active uh, computer science research. So, you know, DeepMind, uh, the Google company that um, devoted a lot of resources to Go, the ancient Chinese board game, also devoted a lot of resources to StarCraft, the very modern real-time strategy computer game. So. We just had to had to close the door at some point. Not certainly not a perfect uh, set of criteria, but um, but that that was the reason why we we stuck with these sort of quote unquote classic uh, games that we did. I have another question here from um, Tynan or Tynan. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, but um, what's your uh, favorite modern board game? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, like a lot of, I don't know, Americans of my age, I played a ton of Settlers of Catan. That was sort of my, my entree, just like many others, into sort of the world of quote-unquote modern board game design, Euro games. And, you know, I'm nothing but 
but a huge fan of uh, recent developments in in board game design, really a golden age of of board game design and play. And, you know, roughly speaking, the sort of migration from from Europe to the US. I haven't haven't played a ton uh, recently. I've been really immersed in the games in the book, but um, I I received Wingspan uh, for Christmas, played with my family and uh, a very... I don't know that I would say it rivals the elegant beauty of Go, but a very, very beautiful game um, in its own right, which which many modern games are. And probably comes as no surprise to hear me say, like, games playing is is to the good without limit. So I applaud, I applaud all the developments in in that world in that world recently. Yeah, I often say that um, uh, Settlers of Catan is the gateway drug for uh, <laughs> for board gaming. Um, so another question here from Alexander is, uh, that you mentioned that computer programmers view games as a test bed, but, um, do you find that the people that you meet in those communities feel similarly, or is that not something that is consciously important to players in these games? Meaning that test they... Beds for a, um, test beds for intelligence or some form of logical reasoning or probabilistic thinking. Yeah, me- meaning that they, the humans, think of it as a testbed for themselves, or meaning that they agree with the computer programmers that it's a testbed for their computer. I could try to answer both questions. He's saying the former. The former. Um, I think to some extent, sure. I think I think there is this sort of fraught history um, that sort of intertwined games, skill at games playing, and specifically I'm thinking of chess with a broader idea of intelligence, whatever that means. So not to uh, stray from the question too much, but maybe illustrative is if you look back at this uh, famous document proposing kind of the first AI symposium ever held at Dartmouth in the 1950s, they wanted their programs to do sort of the highest callings of human intelligence. And they listed them out. And it was like, compose beautiful music, solve, approve mathematical theorems, and play chess. These were like the three things that sort of for them encompassed um, the higher calling, the highest callings of the human mind. Chess was like right there. And I think that idea persisted for a long time time and I think has been recently sort of rightfully like complicated intelligence is not one single thing being good at chess is not equal to being intelligent and vice versa so I think I think most good games players today would tell you well if you ask them what does it mean that you're good at poker they would say well it means that I'm good at poker and it means that I spent a long time diving into this you know tiny tiny but very deep well that is this game poker chess whatever it is and little else and i think like that that would be they would be perfectly satisfied if if you agreed with them that they were were good at poker and this is probably like way too rambling of an answer but there's sort of this unanswered question of okay if machines if game if games are test beds for machines what are they test beds for Right. What are these machines doing now? And, you know, the answer is maybe not that much, but maybe that's changing. So there's extreme examples like Deep Blue, the machine, the IBM machine that beat uh, Kasparov in 1997 was disassembled right after the match and did literally nothing else. But you have more modern uh, ideas, deep learning neural network ideas like those that uh, conquered Go a few years ago that ideas from that are like now folding proteins and aiding drug discovery. And so it's, I think it's a very, very complicated what the relationship is between a very, very specific game and knowledge and, and achievement more, more broadly. Apologies to whoever asked that <laughs> question. So this will be our last question. And that's um, if the book were called eight games, what would the eighth game be? I suppose what, what didn't make the mm. cut here? <laughs> So there, there really wasn't anything that wound up on the cutting room floor, to be honest. It, it was originally going to be six games, and I convinced my editor that I could do a good 
chapter on Scrabble in a few weeks. And of course it took a few months or, or whatever. But, you know, I, I think if, if it, there were an eighth game, I, I think I would try to pull the lens back and zoom out a lot and try to grapple with this question I was just uh, rambling about, frankly, in the previous answer, which is what are, the, what are these programs doing next? And Bernard Suits, this philosopher of games who said that games are the uh, voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles, had a famous paper called Is Life a Game? So, you know, lots of things are, I would just say lots of things are games that we don't, that don't come in a game box, right? Um, uh, million dollar auctions are a game. Uh, um, political campaigns are a game. Warfare and courtship and all these things are, are games. And I really believe that. And I think if I was to add an eighth game to sort of expand from, from these ancient pursuits that I do discuss, I would try to try to make the argument a little more firmly that like we're playing games all the time, uh, whether we know it or not. Yeah, I think that if you look at the landscape of modern board games today, you'll see that there's a recognition by game designers of that fact too, because all the sort of new games that are coming out are about replicating things in real life that have that sort of nature that you've described. Well, I, I wanna thank you uh, one more time, Ollie, for not just for your time tonight, but for writing this book. It's an incredible book and if folks who are listening haven't read it yet, you should order it right now. I gifted the first of what I'm sure will be many copies of your book just this weekend. Um, I think it's gonna have a permanent place on my bookshelf. It'll be one that I'm recommending to people forever. I, I really thank you for writing it and um, thank you to everybody for hanging in here and listening to our conversation and thank you to Katie and Greenlight for hosting this. I thought this was really fun. Well, David, that is way too kind. Thank you so much for saying it. And yes, thanks to you and Greenlight uh, for hosting me and everybody watching. This was a blast. Thank you so much. Oliver and David, thank you both so much for that fantastic discussion. And thanks everybody for joining us. Don't forget to buy your copy of Seven Games in store or online at greenlightbookstore.com and use that code GreenlightEvents10 for 10% off at checkout. Also make sure you request a signed or personalized copy by midnight tonight if you would like Oliver to sign or personalize your book. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great night.